it's Kate Brownfield from ADHDKidsCanThrive.com. Thank you for listening. If you're enjoying this podcast, please like, comment, and share as it'll help others find the ADHD Kids Can Thrive podcast. Today, my guest is Dr. Steve Hinshaw, Distinguished Professor of Psychology at UC Berkeley and a Professor of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at UC San Francisco. He is author of several books, many related to ADHD. To name just a few titles, one is called ADHD, What Everyone Needs to Know, and another book titled Straight Talk About ADHD in Girls, How to Help Your Daughter Thrive. Please enjoy our conversation. All right, Dr. Hinshaw, thank you for joining me today. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Eager to get started. Yeah, good. Okay, so you have um, a plethora of expertise when it comes to ADHD, but there's two things I wanted to focus on with you today. And um, one was talking about the stigma and misunderstandings that come from having ADHD or the association of ADHD. And then the second topic we're going to cover is um, what ADHD looks like in women and girls. Yeah, great. Okay, so let's get started. Let's start with the first topic, which is uh, the stigma and misunderstandings that are related to ADHD. Why is this such a polarizing condition? And the name just like creates so much um, division in the world. Well, that's the $64 billion question. And Stigma is a term with origins in both ancient uh, Greek language and ancient Latin language. And it literally refers to burns or brands. You brand someone who was in an out group. If I was at the Agora in ancient Athens, the marketplace, agoraphobia literally means fear of the marketplace. How would I know if I were shopping next to um, somebody who'd fought for Sparta or was a a traitor or former slave? The Greek government, the Athenian government, would brand in the neck and shoulder that you were such a person, so everyone would know. Most stigma today is psychological. Hitler, for those people in concentration camps, tattooed or burned letters and numbers into the left wrists of people in camps. Many nations literally branded HIV-positive individuals in the 80s before treatment became readily accessible and effective. But today, it's less a physical brand than a psychological brand. And there's a ton of work on this concept of stigma as applied to mental and neurodevelopmental disorders, and I've written about it extensively. One of the key points is that it the, the rule of thumb is the more severe the condition and the more chronic the condition, the worse the stigma. Chronic illness is more stigmatized than occasional flu right and then of course we came up with you know discovery the covid and the epidemic and the and the pandemic and so <clears throat> covid because of its potentially longer lasting phenomena and because of its contagion could have been pretty stigmatized a, a lot of controversy there too but the point is adhd doesn't seem on the face of it as severe as schizophrenia or bipolar disorder or ptsd conditions that receive a lot of stigma. Many people with ADHD do fine, you know, kids during uh, English and not so well during algebra or vice versa. It's a condition marked by consistent inconsistency. Right. In fact, to get scientific and wonky for a second, there's a lot of work on is it working memory or is it planning or is it cognitive control? What are these executive functions? Which one is the most telling for kids and adults with ADHD? And it's a trick question. The answer is all of the above. No matter what the task is that an individual with ADHD uh, is engaged, the mark is how consistently inconsistent the performance is. You get it right for a couple trials and then maybe you space out or you don't regulate your attention well. So the mark of the disorder, even at a brain science level, is inconsistent performance, highly variable performance. But you see, that provides a clue. If I see you or someone else, and I'm led to believe you have ADHD, but you seem to hold it together during one conversation, but lose it in another, 
or you do well in casual friendships, but intimate relationships are trickier. Or you can do well in job A, but at job B that requires a whole lot of executive control, you don't do so well. It must be you. You're not trying. When people are inconsistent, we make the attribution that it's under their personal control. And intriguingly, autism spectrum disorder, schizophrenia, which can be chronic, stigma in some ways may be less than in the old days because we understand there's a biological basis and the person is, quote, afflicted across most situations. So ADHD receives a lot of stigma because we really don't believe the person has a, quote, condition. They're just not trying hard enough. They're just spacing out. And if only they put their mind to it, they could get the job done. Right. Okay. And then I think we see in media, they play on that, right? By saying ADHD doesn't exist. It's not a real thing. And then that's what creates conflict inside parents from taking action, right? Because you go... Yeah, it's such a multifaceted topic. ADHD has, and a lot of interesting research has been done on this, remarkably consistent prevalence across the world, maybe except in a few subsistence nations that don't have compulsory education, where ADHD would be low on the priority of ever getting diagnosed, but across Asia and Europe, South America, Oceania, About 5 to 6% of kids get a diagnosis of ADHD if you do the right evidence-based interviews, checklists, get a developmental history, et cetera. However, the U.S. and Israel have about double that rate. Yeah. Very high achievement societies. Are there really more kids with ADHD in those societies? Or do we look for it because, gee, maybe that's a threat to our school district's test scores? Or maybe because we're so concerned about performance, especially these days in kids from lower social classes, ADHD can be a convenient diagnosis to give in five or 10 minutes in a pediatrician's office without the evidence-based assessments. So people say, you're just making it up. There's no such thing. And overdiagnosis can be a problem without good assessments. But as we'll talk about in a few minutes, for girls and women still, there's a tendency to underdiagnose because everybody knew since the history of hyperkinesis, hyperactivity, MBD, ADD, ADHD has unfolded. It's a guy thing. Girls don't really have it or get it. And so uncovering that myth and showing that girls can and do have ADHD um, can help to set the record straight. But then girls may have their own stigma because it's not expected. Girls are supposed to be compassionate. Girls are supposed to be focused. 60% of college students in the U.S. today are women, not guys. And so it defies the stereotypes that a girl could have ADHD, especially because ADHD can wreak havoc with close relationships. And so there's almost a double stigma of being female and having ADHD. Oh, interesting. Okay. And it takes longer for, okay. So we'll get into that. So let's move into that. that. Let's move into girls and ADHD and how that looks different than in boys. So when I was in grad school at an unnamed university a few decades ago, we learned that what was then called hyperactivity or hyperkinesis soon changed to ADD with the DSM-3 was a fairly benign condition because it stopped when you hit puberty. Because what was emphasized were the physical axes of driven by a motor, squirmy, fidgety symptoms. The executive issues, the poor regulation of attention and volition persist in the vast majority of kids with ADHD well past childhood. Yeah. And okay. And I is- just heard too, that back then too, if you were taking medication for ADHD, you stopped it at like age 16 because well, it was like, you, you were just take a medication for something that really disappeared. And if right. the focus was on the physical symptoms, didn't seem like you really had the condition anymore. And yeah. the second myth I learned was uh, ADHD is a guy thing. Yeah. Girls didn't have autism. We'd call it now called autism spectrum. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Girls didn't have hyperkinesis or ADHD. Well, it turns out that to be again academic for a moment, neurodevelopmental disorders, these conditions that appear in the first few years of life, autism spectrum, ADHD, 
Tourette, some forms of learning disability, there is a male predominance. During gestation, those of us born with an XY chromosome configuration, biological males, that little puny Y chromosome with only about 40 or 50 genes on it, one of the signals from those genes is you start pumping in your system at a few weeks of age, testosterone and other androgens, which makes you a biological male. Those same androgens slow your brain development. At birth and for the first few years of life, girls are way ahead of boys in terms of language development, empathy, cognitive skills. So it's little wonder that social conditions like autism, executive cognitive conditions like ADHD do have a male predominance, about three to one for autism, about two and a half to one uh, for ADHD. But because we didn't believe that girls could have ADHD, and because the very instruments that were used back in the day to diagnose ADHD, the old Connors scale hyperkinesis index had 10 items. Do it in a doctor's office checklist. Eight of the 10 items were exclusively about overactivity. Only two about inattention. Oh. So little, it was a self-fulfilling prophecy. Girls can't get it. We use the diagnostic screener. Boys have more of these symptoms. So two things. There are more boys than girls with ADHD. There are more boys than girls with autism. But autism and ADHD are very real when they exist in girls. And especially for ADHD, girls' symptoms more often than is the case for boys deal with inattention and poor regulation. It's not as visible. You're not running around a classroom. So for girls, the DSM says, well, you have to have these symptoms before the age of 12 in at least two settings. But for many girls who are smart and who are trying hard and whose families are pushing, et cetera, et cetera, perfectionism develops, you don't see until middle school or high school or even well beyond the manifestations of the symptoms when all the coping and all the compensation breaks down. So it's often a much later diagnosis. The symptoms have been present in subtle form in girls for a long time, but we don't notice them till sometimes too late in the game. Yeah. Okay. And you kind of touched on this. Do you think school's set up to more of a girl brain versus a boy brain, regardless of ADHD? Oh boy. That's a, a, a culture wars question. If there ever <laughs> was one. I mean, well, the question is, does it play just girls the way they're designed? Just so have a more natural affinity to kind of. Girls are, as I mentioned a moment ago, you know, at ages two and three and four, more they have more, bigger vocabularies, more social, more compliant. Girls seem to do better in school, and the test scores show this in many subjects, uh, for a long time compared to boys. So if a girl who may be suffering in silence, she's got the inattentive form of ADHD, not so much running around, but can't understand two-part directions or can't remember what the teacher said from one period to the next, or never remembers homework because it's lost in the backpack, and et cetera, et cetera. That girl in some ways is gonna receive more stigma and shame because she's not doing what girls are expected to do. And for gosh sake, we don't see the visible hyperactivity, hyperactivity of a boy. She must just either have depression or anxiety or just not be trying hard. So it's really kind of a triple whammy. Yeah. Okay. And then do girls show those signs of um, like emotional dysregulation So and flexibility, the parts of like being disorganized? So 27 years ago, my team and I wrote a grant to the National Institute of Mental Health to use the summer camp sort of platform, day camps for boys with ADHD and a half of the boys had, were neurotypicals, you know, kind of a control group built in. Could we use the same method to study a large sample of girls with ADHD? Took two tries. The government finally said, yeah, we think this is a good idea. It got a really high priority score. So we started the BGALS study, the Berkeley Girls with ADHD Longitudinal Study, B-G-A-L-S. Yeah, it's always good to have an acronym. So we learned tons about 140 girls with ADHD, 90 neurotypicals, in these camps, published a lot of information. And these girls in an all-girl setting 
showed across multiple forms of measurement the same kinds of academic and social uh, impairments as boys. So we kind of okay. put ADHD in the mapping girls. But we then, we told the families, we want to study your daughters the rest of their lives. And with a new grant every five or six years, we're now in our fifth wave. Every participant's now in her 30s. So they're not girls anymore. It's been a long time. Yeah. And so this is the largest longitudinal study in the world of girls with ADHD. To make a very long story short, compared to boys' follow-up studies, our own and many others, where many boys with ADHD, especially if they're pretty ornery when they're younger, uh, go on to juvenile hall, have a pretty aggressive trajectory. Boys tend to abuse substances more than with ADHD, more than neurotypicals. Our girls were somewhat more aggressive than neurotypical girls, but not nearly as aggressive as our boys with ADHD. Didn't have the same rates of substance abuse, although some clearly did. But when we started to add measures in during the teen years and 20s, what we found was that the girls with ADHD, compared to their neurotypical you know, camp mates, had four to five times more unplanned pregnancies by the age of 25 were three times more likely to have been victims of sexual assault. Oh, wow. And by the a ripe old age of 19 or 20, and then it increased to the late 20s, a quarter of the girls with ADHD had made a serious attempt on their lives. And over half were engaging in cutting, burning, what we call NSSI, non-suicidal self-injury three to four times higher than their neurotypical comparison uh, peers. So what we think, and we've been writing and thinking a lot about this, <clears throat> if you're a girl with ADHD, whether you have the predominantly inattentive form or you're more rambunctious, uh, you know, the combined presentation as it's now called, either way, you're rejected by your peer group because girls value social closeness and why does that girl with ADHD ignore me? Or why does she interrupt all the time? And of course, the teachers say, well, if she only tried harder, because they don't really understand that maybe hasn't been a, a good diagnosis of ADHD. And the girl starts a process, which happens to so many teen girls at puberty and beyond, of rumination, self-recrimination, self-blame. And so self-injury and depression and anxiety are at epic epidemic levels among all teenage girls and young women in our country today, yeah. just the statistics, the culture of despair. But if you have a pre-existing condition like ADHD, that risk about doubles. So we think that early ADHD in girls is less of a risk factor for acting out behavior against other people, but a very strong risk factor for, again, uh, problems in intimate relationships, uh, Unplanned pregnancies because you haven't used your executive functions to uh, do safe sex or, or use protection and a huge tendency to blame yourself for the shortcomings in your life. And these these rates of self-injury, we now know because the rest of the world, including Scandinavia, where all the millions of people in those countries, every doctor's visit, every school looks, but everything's in a national record for men and women with ADHD compared to neurotypicals, rates of suicide are about double, and especially so in women. So what we're seeing for girls, just to try to, you know, uh, uh, kind of put a bow on this for a minute, yeah. is a very pronounced tendency to some dark future moments ahead if she doesn't get the right kinds of treatment early enough in life. And all, often girls aren't diagnosed, as I said before, until yeah. adolescence or later. But evidence-based interventions then, medications if they're the right meds, uh, cognitive behavior therapy, dialectical behavior therapy, DBT can make a big difference. Okay. So that was a good, a lot of great insight into how it is going for girls with ADHD. And I want to say too, Kate, that as our follow-up now continues beyond the teens and 20s into the 30s, we're not quite, I mean, we started this during the pandemic. We're doing it all online. It's, you know, the the way of the world in research of the last few years. But many of them who had real struggles with self-regulation and with emotion regulation, if they can get through to a good relationship, a job that's satisfying, 
the brains of all of us don't fully mature for guys until we're <laughs> 28 20 <laughs> girls and their what, okay what is the answer what is the guidance on that with girls with adhd does their brain take longer to mature so than the, the typical girl well the, the classic study of this and it's, it's been replicated was done by philip shaw at the national institutes of health over 20 years ago now it's a long-term study where they would do mri magnetic resonance imaging um just structural imaging to look at size of the brain, especially of the frontal lobes, the frontal cortex. I'm pointing to my forehead. The cortex is the bark. It's the outer layer of the brain, the gray matter where the cell bodies are. And for both boys and girls with ADHD, a large number of them are about three to four to five years delayed in the development of the prefrontal cortex, average age uh, of that development, maximum thickness of the cortex is about six in neurotypical kids and closer to 10 in kids with ADHD. And as they mature, as the brain starts to reprune and the cortex reaches its adult side, they still remain behind. So interestingly, one of the old names for ADHD 50 plus years ago was called the immaturity syndrome. These are oh. kids that kind of act younger than their chronological years. And the work of Shaw and others shows that immaturity isn't just at a behavioral or emotional level. It's at the level of brain development in many cases. Yeah. I could, that's kind of an, still makes sense, right? Makes immaturity. Sense. Sen yeah. Okay. I was going to ask you too, for girls, did you find in your study, they're more uh, susceptible to eating disorders as well? So it's an interesting uh, question. And so by our first follow-up when they were not in grade school anymore, but in their mid teens, we found at a symptom level, not so much anorexic style perfectionism, but binge eating and a lot of the impulse control style bulimic symptoms. Okay. By the time they got in their 20s, our neurotypical sample of girls had almost caught up with them to the same rates. So, and that may be a Bay Area phenomenon, we're not sure. So, we do know that for many girls with ADHD, it's not just regulation of cognitions during homework, but it's regulation of sleep-wake cycles and it's regulation of appetite. And so it can be a risk, although we didn't find as much of that in our BGAL sample as we did some of these other forms of dysregulation. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And so why are, so just culturally too, what's happening is girls are getting diagnosed later. I should say women. That's right. It, it's like the highest point of diagnoses lately. It's, it's so, I mean, for decades, women never got a diagnosis. And so when your base rate is low, any change is huge. The fastest growing market for ADHD medications is adults, women with ADHD. Now, this is a good thing if the assessment is accurate, because for so many of these women, Oh, when I was a teen, uh, my shrink said I had an anxiety disorder. Well, you may have had anxiety secondary to having had lifelong ADHD that no one ever detected. Right. Right. And so we have to understand that it's every woman who walks into an ADHD specialty clinic or her general practitioner's office who, and you know about the TikTok phenomenon, there's a lot of self-report scales now out online diagnose your own ADHD. Now that can be very helpful to get a conversation started, but it can lead to false positives. Maybe there is an addiction issue. Maybe there is major depression and sorting out what is what. You can't do that in 10 minutes on a, a TikTok questionnaire and you can't do that in 15 minutes in a doctor's office. It's going to take some hours of detective work to sort it out. Okay. So go to a person who is properly trained. That's right. And spend go the time. Advocacy group, self-help groups. Find the person in your community or the persons or the group who really knows something about adult ADHD and ADHD and women and use their wisdom to guide. It's um, it's a marathon, not a sprint to get a good diagnosis. It's going to take some time and effort. Yeah. And you touched on that anxiety and ADHD too is very sure. confusing. Like are it's there they can be friends and or is it one or the other, that kind of thing? Well, it's the chicken and the egg. I mean, we know that some kids at a, at a pretty young age get 
paralyzed by anxiety. That can look like the inattentive form of ADHD because you're kind of paralyzed and you're not speaking up and you're afraid to say the wrong answer. If a kid has a pure anxiety disorder and you put them on a trial of stimulant medications, the anxiety is only going to worsen. But many kids with ADHD, boys and girls, in some ways, paradoxically, about a third of them have a coexisting anxiety disorder too. Fears of the dark, agoraphobia, fears of being out in public. And it turns out that those are the kids who need good treatment for their ADHD and sometimes a different medication or cognitive behavior therapy to work on the anxiety too. So it's not either or, it can be both and. Right. Okay. Very good. Okay. So Steve, as we wrap up, what's kind of like with all your knowledge that you have, which we just touched on the tip of the iceberg, if you will, what would be your words of wisdom for parents who are raising um, ADHD kids? And in this case, you know, ADHD girls. So number one, we'll we'll try to do top five list. Okay. ADHD is real. Don't believe the websites, don't believe the headlines that says it's just a myth. But number two, it's going to take a lot of detective work, whether that's about a kid of yours or a teen of yours or yourself or an adult kid of yours, to get the right assessment to find out what part of this is ADHD and what part of it is anxiety, depression, or the other things. Number three, if you're a parent... And in my most recent book called Straight Talk About ADHD in Girls, came out last year, I took until page two to put in a couple of concepts that come in from dialectical behavior therapy, DBT, yeah, which is not a treatment for ADHD per se. It's a treatment for kids with suicidal tendencies and pretty severe emotion dysregulation. And two of the terms from DBT are called radical acceptance and radical commitment. So what's radical acceptance? I'm a parent, talk about parents now with girls, maybe she's not whom I expected. You know, I expected uh, a girl would be pretty compliant and we argue all the time and she, we always fight over homework and uh, she doesn't seem to keep friends for very long because of her uh, interruptions and she doesn't seem to read social cues. It's not your fault. The genes are mainly responsible for why some kids have ADHD and some don't. But what you need to do is at the same time you accept she's going to be different. You've got to radically commit to finding her strengths and getting medication if she needs it at the right dose and the right kind of medication and working with the family and the school to have consistent discipline and consistent supports for her learning in a very positive environment. Yeah. Number four, you may not really realize, especially for a girl until her teen years or or later in a straight talk about ADHD and girls at the end of chapter three, a uh, former grad student at Berkeley, who's now a postdoc at UCSF, Sarah Chung, uh, has a vignette in there about getting diagnosed with ADHD at age 30 when she was a doctoral student after years of half knowing, but because of cultural issues and family issues and denial She felt horrible about her life, even had suicidal ideas, as smart as she was. The ADHD diagnosis unleashed the right treatment and a new sense of self. It was empowering. So it's never too late to get a good diagnosis. Yeah. And number five is never give up hope. It's never too late to turn the tables with treatment, to have a more positive outlook and do that strength finding. And... Adults with ADHD who have been suffering for many years can have a much more productive life with diagnosis and treatment. Yeah, and understanding. Thank you, Steve. This was great. 